today's release marks the culmination of a year long effort. And it was a lot of effort where the partnership and IBM Center led webinars with government leaders on emerging cloud paradigms to improve operations and even more importantly, to serve the public more effectively. You'll hear about how agencies are increasing their use of open cloud ecosystems in industry that involve multiple secure cloud platforms and how they're integrating cloud with other infrastructure in a hybrid fashion. And you'll hear how technological advances can drive improved mission performance um, involving governmental services led by our speakers today from GSA and OPM and extended to cloud systems that help FEMA respond to natural, natural disasters in the field, help NOAA address weather and climate change, bringing key data to private sector partners, help the Census Bureau make major changes that ease the process of collecting information from citizens and help NIH accelerate scientific discovery across the nation. IBM is proud to continue our, partner our partnership and collaboration with the Partnership for Public Service across many years. Uh, we're building on our past work that we've done together around using data to make smarter decisions and fostering a greater understanding of the promise of artificial intelligence and intelligent automation. Um, to kick things off, I'm super honored to introduce our keynote sp speaker, David Shive, the CIO of the General Services Administration, uh, who will then turn it over to our panel. Dave oversees GSA's information technology operations and budget ensuring its alignment with agency and administration strategic objectives and priorities. Dave is also the vice chair of the federal CIO council. Prior to being named CIO in 2012, Dave was the director of the Office of Enterprise Infrastructure, responsible for the enterprise information technology infrastructure platforms and capability that support the GSA business enterprise. He was also the acting director of HR and FM systems for the GSA CFO and CPO offices. Prior to joining GSA, he served in the District of Columbia government as the CIO. Dave is the recipient of numerous awards, including the Washington DC CFO Meritorious Service Award, State and Local Government Executive Management Award, and the Management Award for Transformational Technology, as well as the Fed 100. Please join me in welcoming Dave to the platform. Good morning, everyone. Um, so, yeah, I'm David Chive. I'm the CIO at GSA. Uh, I've been looking forward to the conversation all day. Um, I, I'm actually so passionate about cloud utilization in the federal government that I actually have notes, so I didn't forget anything. <laughs> Most of you know that I don't often talk off of notes, but uh, if you see me looking down, it's because I don't want to forget anything. Um, first, I want to thank the Partnership for Public Service for having me here and the IBM Center for the Business of Government. Um, for their great work in putting together the report. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing lots of traction within the federal enterprise uh, as they consume that report um, and answering any questions about it as well. So thank you for that great work. Um, so it's a pretty exciting time in federal IT. When people ask, why are you still in government after all these years? I say, because now is the time. There's this uh, joining of capability and people and investment by this administration to, to really solve some real tough government problems uh, using technology as a key enabler for that. So I'm super excited about that. Um, cloud and uh, remote compute are driving mission critical outcomes across government. And it's helping us to innovate uh, how we interact with citizens, uh, which is ult our ultimate goal here. Uh, we have all of these technologies at our fingertips now. Um, they're mature now. We're getting good outcomes now. Um, and we can do things like advanced analytics on these platforms and artificial intelligence. And these all help our agencies realize the benefits of hybrid cloud, multi-cloud environments, and also enable government to operate in the same way as the citizens we serve operate in their personal lives as, as the best practice. Over the past decade, the pace of cloud adoption has reached critical mass in government. It's no longer a, you know, maybe we'll do this, it's we're gonna do this, and if there's compelling reasons why we won't, we'll consider maybe what those are. Agencies have taken full advantage of the pay-as-you-go service uh, flexibilities and the lo low upfront cost to cloud, which has often been a barrier to, to government utilization. 
Um, this conversation is not new. Uh, it started out as cloud first and then moderate, uh, modified into cloud smart, which is right. That's government iterating in response to changing technology and changing business needs and stuff like that. That was the right thing. Thanks, Margie, for being a part of that. Um, and, uh, and this conversation continues as we think about how we're going to continue to modernize and transform the way we operate and how we're going to consume service as a government. Ten years ago, agencies asked if they should move to the cloud. Um, fast forward to where we are now, agencies are asking what remains to be moved to the cloud. And that's a tough question. And I suspect that the panel's discussion today is going to center a fair amount on that. Um, cloud does and will continue to look very different for, very, uh, for every agency. For my industry partners in the room, please understand that and know that. There's no one size fits all for everybody. Um, and your solutioning that's specific to agencies is going to remain critically important to success there. Um, agencies should focus on edge cases since they've transformed a lot of their stuff to the cloud. They should be taking a hard look at those edge cases and saying what's, what remains suitable to cloud. Cloud modernization is easy when they're with a big obvious initiative, moving your mail to the cloud and your back office operations. But for those edge cases, it's important to have that cloud smart mindset that I talked about, have an ecosystem that supports that model and governance processes in place um, that will provide insight driven decisions into investments into technology. Now that we've done all of this work on cloud computing over the last decade, I want to leave you with five quick focus areas to take full advantage of the cloud in the future. Invest in your talent. This has been um, a hallmark of cloud done right in government for years. The agencies that invest in their talent, bring their workforce up with, with modern practice and training are the ones that do really well. As we move to cloud smart, we must invest in these cloud users um, as well. And it's not just a tech team activity, you know, delivering via Dev, DevSecOps where you have your security people, your developers, your operations people in the business, they all have to know what they're doing and get behind the process. Next is uh, measure what matters. Uh, I've, I talk all the time when people say, how do you measure your tech? I say, I really don't measure tech, I measure business outcomes. And if I'm doing tech right, those business outcomes are going to be measurable, demonstrated, and I'll be able to know what those are. And it helps me have my conversations with my businesses. Um, adopt core metrics to measure team delivery performance, such as, I wrote a list down, uh, lead time, deployment frequency, change failure rate, time to restore service, quality, velocity, all those kind of agile measures. It's important that you're measuring across those spectrums so that you can continue to iterate to better outcomes. And then the last is create, or if you already have it, maintain a culture of change. Um, you know, the, the rapid pace of change of business here in the 21st century is not just the domain of the commercial world. It is absolutely the domain of the federal government um, facilitated by things like administration change or changing business priorities or new and emerging technology that can help government present itself to its citizens and its stakeholders more effectively. You have to build that culture of change into your delivery teams on the business and on the technology side so they're not, they're not afraid of it. Those who know me say, oh, no, I always say I don't like change and here I'm in tech, um, <laughs> but, but you have to embrace it even if you don't like that and work that into your team. So thanks for the opportunity to kick off today's event. I've been looking forward to this all week. Um, I hope everyone challenges yourself today to not only listen to uh, about the exciting technical landscape, but the really excellent talent, like Guy, Guy somewhere in here, um, as you have uh, the conversation about what works and what doesn't, an honest uh, look at what doesn't work, and um, and consider what the impacts are going to be on your agency. Looking forward to this. So I want to turn it over to Emma now from Partnership. The maturation and evolution of IT architectures, it's not just migrating from on-prem to single cloud to now hybrid and multi-cloud setups. It's uh, agencies that are scaling um, their human capital and their infrastructure and their capacity to serve their missions. As David noted, the federal government is doing it now. And across conversations with agencies with different missions, modes of operations, and at varying stages in their cloud journey, we noted innovations and initiatives, some listed here, more detailed in our brief. Um, but we wanted to ask what were the questions undergirding these plays? The key factors and considerations 
With that, we proposed a five point framework, uh, which you can see in the brief and briefly summarized here in this table um, on the keys to successful cloud computing. We complement these with profiles from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, the Department of Veterans Affairs, the Census Bureau, and the National Institutes of Health, wherein we advise agencies, again, regardless of their vantage point, to plan. For careful planning and strategic collaboration makes cloud computing ready for use wherever they are in the field. To test, because agile testing catches critical issues before cloud deployment. To secure, as zero trust and security focused teams protect cloud data and the data of the public. To transform because support for people using the cloud fosters innovation. And finally, to optimize as cloud optimization strategies reduce cost, maximizes performance, and drives us closer to our mission. I implore you all to seek out the brief before, during, and after this event. But without further ado, I would like to pass over to new insights that we can garner in this time together um, by inviting Dan Chenick, who is the moderator of our panel with OPM federal agency leaders. Uh, one note about the framework that Emma described, the thing that I think is really interesting about it, you see a lot of these kinds of technology frameworks and they're often sort of done through study and, and analysis. This is a very experiential framework. It was developed based on the interviews that Emma described with the agency she mentioned and other leaders across government. So it's really sort of a, a reflects the reality of what agency cloud leaders are experiencing and what our team and the partnerships team kind of discern from that. So, so think about it as, as complementing maybe some of those maturity models and bringing it to life in terms of how do you make this, this real. Um, so it's my honor to introduce our three panelists, uh, Guy Cavallo, who is the CIO for the Office of Personnel Management. Um, uh, guys, I've got two of his senior team uh, here today with us in the room is Dan Jacobs. Uh, Dan is the uh, Cloud Solutions Architect and the Acting Director of Digital Services at OPM. And on the Zoom is, is Al Himmler. Al is the Cloud uh, Center of Excellence Co-Chair. Uh, at OPM. And I should note that one an OPM leader who we worked with closely in the research phase of the report, Akanksha Sharma, gave great insights to OPM. She's recently left OPM, uh, but she was a great asset to us and we're, we were happy to work with Akanksha as well. Um, so I want to just get started uh, by asking each of you, um, just talk a little bit about your role and think back to your first experience with the cloud. And Guy, can, can we go ahead? All right. Well, first of all, I want to thank the center and IBM for giving my team a chance to fill you in on where we are with OPM. Uh, those of you who have seen me in the news, uh, and I guess I'm one of the elder statesmen of IT now. I'm going to give you a brief history, not through a plan, but just through my career path. I was at Xerox when they invented the PC. A few months later, IBM released their PC and legitimized the business. Then when I was at Microsoft, they announced a project in 2008 called Project Red Dog, which later on became Azure and was the first commercial, large commercial cloud vendor. So not by a, a very well planned out career path, but I look at it, I've had my hands on a PC and on the cloud as long as anybody on the face of the earth could do that. <laughs> uh, and my question for the for the uh, audience today, and also uh, you know, those online, is it's been 18 months since Azure was released. My, Microsoft's operating system at the time was Vista. How many of you, well, maybe I don't want you to raise your hand. How many of you are still running Vista and realize we've had Windows 7, 8, 10, and 11? How much longer do we have to wait before the cloud is not considered too new? So I'm, I lead this merry group here. Uh, luckily, I've had three federal agencies to take to the cloud, and I'll share some of the lessons learned uh, each time. Uh, and one thing is having these two gentlemen help me. Uh, would have liked having them in my other two agencies, but uh, definitely at OPM size, it's a big help. So good morning, everyone. Um, I don't do a whole lot of public speaking, so uh, you will forgive me if I falter a little bit. Uh, so I'm Dan Jacobs. Uh, I came to OPM uh, from GSA Centers of Excellence. Uh, G GSA was a fantastic group. I had uh, the absolute honor to work with the best CIO in, in federal government. Um, and then when I moved to OPM, I also had the honor of working <laughs> So it's it's been it's been great. Um, I've been I've been really blessed. Um, 
But prior to that, uh, I, I worked with the Department of State, and uh, that is my uh, first, I want to say, real introduction uh, into, into cloud. I was brought on as a um, security architect for a new enterprise initiative under the department that was called the Foreign Affairs Network. Uh, if you're not familiar with state, there's basically two sides. There's the foreign affairs side, and then there's everyone who is supposed to support the foreign affairs side. And uh, this was a, a cloud native enterprise built specifically for supporting our diplomatic missions abroad, uh, because it's, uh, strangely enough, exceedingly difficult to deliver secure communications to literally every country on the planet. And so, you know, especially when we have all of our data centers and everything located within the continental United States. So can we do this better? And they brought me in and said, okay, um, this is the plan, cloud data enterprise, uh, do some security stuff, go. Great. Uh, so the first thing I did was uh, basically I just sparked up Google and I said, is, is there such a thing as security operations center as a service? And I got zero hits. And you don't have to be long in this world to understand if Google doesn't give you a whole lot of hits on something, there's a very good chance nothing like that existed. Um, so I set myself to actually creating it. And what would cloud-based or cloud-native security services look like for a cloud-native enterprise? Uh, at the time, no one in federal government was doing this. Nothing, nothing like this had ever existed. And now you can't swing a stick in this town without hitting at least $15 billion corporations who are ready to do it for you. So uh, that gives you a little in indication of how old I am, um, at least in cloud. And um, Prior to that, not a whole lot of work mattered. Uh, did a lot of computer network operations. So, um, you know, that was dark dark stuff within the uh, DOD. And uh, I think way, way back in 1984, I actually wrote my first application. Uh, it was a game because my parents wouldn't buy me one. So I just, I determined to make my own, which was a horrible idea because who knows, after you make your own game, you know everything about it. So it was a really, really poor decision, but I, <laughs> I learned a lot. <laughs> Well, thank you, Dan. So now let's go to the cloud. Uh, joining us uh, remotely, uh, Al, you want to go ahead? Good morning. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Al Himmler, and uh, I work with these other two gentlemen. I am a co-chair of the Cloud Center of Excellence over at OPM. Dan and I uh, uh, work on that activity together. Um, I, I think that if I had to uh, look back at my first experience getting into the cloud, it was uh, leading a team uh, over at Department of Homeland, Homeland Security. We were migrating uh, what was called the Homeland Security Information Network, or HISN, into the cloud. Um, it was about seven years ago. There was a lot of newness about the cloud. There was a lot of newness about how to work within the cloud. Um, and it was challenging. Um, we found that there were practices that we were used to doing and taking um, for granted on-premise, um, whether it was our infrastructure, how to harden it, how to maintain it, that had all new game rules whenever it came to the cloud. Uh, we had uh, developers working in a separate part of the organization from our operators. That was a challenge because we didn't understand that whenever a developer creates a CI/CD pipeline, that the operators may not actually post the code into the right environment. So we 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 took some bumps. We learned a lot, but it was a great experience, and I think I've carried a lot of those uh, experiences from the Department of Homeland Security forward in terms of uh, being able to apply them uh, now that I'm working over here at OPM. Thanks so much, Al. So let's kind of go through the framework a little bit that that, uh, that Emma introduced and thinking about each part. So starting with planning, and Al, why don't you sort of continue? Talk about a key metric that for the OPM Cloud Center of Excellence. Uh, that you use to, to gouge impact. And why did you pick that metric? Yeah, there's metrics that we look at from um, a business outcome perspective, but the metrics that I'm dealing with really close to my heart right now are financial metrics. So whenever we got started up with the cloud, um, one of the things that we were able to do was um, had the leadership support to marry together our technology business management group or TBM group with a new um, financial operations group or a cloud FinOps group. That allowed us to really sit back and think about what are going to be the cloud budgets, the cloud allocation models that we want to have in place and how we're going to manage those models for making sure that we have the most impact we can with our limited dollars. We don't have all the money in the world, right? And so uh, the way that's influenced us is we've been able to look at our budgets and make choices. What are we going to invest in to build out that core infrastructure that we want in the cloud? Where are we going to make investments in uh, zero trust so that we can scale that up while at the same time having enough budget available 
to migrate the actual systems into the cloud. So it's really influenced kind of how we think about things. And one of the things that we started early as part of the FinOps practice is pulling together the financial people, the technology people and the executives into biweekly meetings and reviewing all of this information. And all that data drives our decisions about how we're going to manage things going forward and who's going to get how much money so that we can uh, make progress in all the initiatives we have. That's great. Anything to add, Guy or Dan? Uh, one of the things that I think uh, eventually when we get to a mature point is that uh, the one metric that's gonna matter the most to me is what it does the customer say? Um, our business outcomes are directly, need to be directly in line with the customer experience. Uh, are our services able to be used? Are they easy to be used? How does the customer feel about our brand when they think OPM or retirement services or whatever it is, do they have the faith and trust and confidence that we're going to take them, give them the services that they need and treat their data respectfully and securely? Um, we're not there yet because we haven't moved but that to me, that end state, that is something that is absolutely critical. And I, I never want to lose sight of that. Yeah, and I'll just add cost savings is not the driver. Uh, what we're talking about is business outcomes, improving citizens interactions. We know that some of our applications will actually cost us less than the cloud. Some are gonna cost more, but these two gentlemen and I, when we go visit our business partners, we never walk in the door and say, move to the cloud because it's gonna save you money. We say move to the cloud because we're going to be able to enhance the customer service. We're going to increase your uptime. We're going to increase your, your interoperability with other data. Uh, cost savings is never on the table. So we, while I know the Hill and the OMB would like us to measure that, we will measure it for that, but that's not our driver. Thanks, Guy. Well, I used to be from OMB, so I'm here to help. Uh, um, <laughs> speaking of security, Dan, you talked a little bit about, uh, about that. So as you're planning these moves and starting to migrate, how do you promote secure data sharing across services, across agencies with, with your partners in the government? Right, well, well, this may come as a surprise, but OPM is, is actually in the business of sharing all kinds of data with all kinds of customers. So uh, we live this, but one of the things that, that when we talk about um, how do we move workloads and how do we do so in a way that best complements our mission and our vision and our objectives, um, we take, Say, say for instance, uh, the mainframe, over 150 disparate connections with different pieces of data, different federal organizations, et cetera, et cetera. If you look at each of those as a specific use case, right? You can apply that use case against a trust or a privacy uh, framework. And if you could apply it against that framework, you, you come with an outcome and that outcome is a specific value. Uh, I think Gartner calls it situational trust. Uh, where you understand the data that you have, the data, how it's going to be used with your partners, and you can build that out in a, in a trust-filled way. So you're not applying one standard uh, template against every single workload or against every single piece of data. You're doing so on an individual use case basis. That, that opens you to all kinds of great things saying, okay, um, we have a pool of data. That data might be used dozens of different ways, but each of those different ways is going to be different. That's not the point. The point is, is that we're now treating data as part of our part of our standard business. And we're going with, with an open data first initiative saying, we're going to share this data. We're going to share this data with anyone who has a viable business need for it. And now we know how best to deliver that data to them. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, Have you come across any barriers as you've been starting to roll out this strategy? You yeah, I, I, I wish you wouldn't ask me that. Um, I, I've <laughs> yeah, the answer is yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. Um, thank you. <laughs> the answer is not technology. Um, technology is there. We, we have the ability to do these things. The answer is almost always fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Uh, the, the folks who have, who have um, created these systems, o and these systems for a long, long time, uh, they have a vested interest in ensuring that uh, their name isn't on the bottom line if something were to go wrong. So therefore we create a culture that resists change. That is our biggest barrier. What we need to help them understand, just like when we, uh, when, when the world basically forced the big three automakers to uh, update how the assembly lines work, to introduce robotics, et cetera, et cetera. We, we need to help 
everyone understand that it's okay to change. And in fact, it's a business requirement. You're in the business to do this. If you're in IT and you don't want to change, you're probably in the wrong career. Guy, anything else to add? Uh, no, I think Dan hit it hit it well. The the culture chain and what 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 I've learned in the three agencies that I've done this with is you you have to show a small success. If you go for the big bang, it's going to take a long time. Then more and more things will be developed on premise. More and more things will be outsourced to third party vendors, and you just have more trouble herding all the cats back into a, an enterprise cloud. So. Uh, I look for a very early success. What we did at OPM was our retirement services call center, which all the annuities, annuitants and retirees call to get updates on was the worst possible designed on-premise call center. I think somebody won an award for using the most number of components and, and vendors to deliver a phone signal. It would go down all the time. I said, look, this is something the cloud has solved it. Let's replace it with a cloud-based call center. Uh, again, even there, we had some doubts. Well, what happens when the cloud goes down? We said, well, what you guys see what happens when the on-premise system goes down. Um, so we got that success and everybody went, oh, maybe the cloud's not that bad. That's great. Well, as a former federal employee and on behalf of all the former federal officials, we thank you um, <laughs> for making the call center uh, more operational. So you talked about the work you've done at SBA uh, and at OPM, what have you, you and your team done to really ensure that all staff across the agency, whether they're on the CIO side or, or in a business office, can apply the cloud regardless of role? Uh, sure, as Dan already highlighted, um, and I've experienced this in any of the government agencies I worked with, usually the training budget for technology is so small that you end up with a handful of people that spend all the money, and then their coworkers always feel like you're favoring them. So we put in place a program where everyone on the staff gets unlimited cloud training without having to fill out paperwork or get approval. And in fact, we even uh, introduced TGIF uh, Fridays, where we insist that every employee take at least part of their days on Friday and spend time training. So what we've seen over time is every month in our monthly all hands, we recognize all the people who have received cloud certifications. You know, in the first month it was like one and now very, uh, very typical. I think we had like five or six this last month. And I'm insisting that everybody in CIO take at least an introduction to the cloud. Even the people who only do procurements and only the people that are do administrative assistant work. I want them all to understand the basics of what we're talking about with the cloud. And because we've done that on the enterprise level, it's allowed me to take my training budget and spend it more on the soft skills uh, that we also needed to, to upgrade. Mm -hmm. How do you go talk to a business customer about ripping their favorite system apart and moving it to the cloud? Uh, again, and don't start that conversation with, I'm gonna save you money, I'm from the CIO. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so we've been able to improve the soft skills and uh, we highlight that every month. And then I give cash awards to everybody that gets a certification. So every possible motivation I can do to get them involved. Uh, I would say 80% probably take advantage of it. The other 20% hope that I'll leave and that they can just <laughs> keep going back the old way. Uh, I know Dave's probably experienced this too. You take as many of them with you on the journey as you can and realize that not everybody's gonna come along on the journey, but what you have to do is if you give them the, the, off, the, the chance to take advantage of these programs, we're seeing a big chunk of them are, are pursuing that. Really actionable transformation, sort of illustrating, Dave, your last point around culture change and how to take little steps to get there. Uh, Dan or Al, anything to add on that? Uh, yeah, I'll add real quickly. Uh, one of the other things that we've done to sort of reinforce this commitment to the cloud is we've included in our performance appraisals for managers that there is an expectation that uh, they have to have cloud related technologies that they're learning. So we're, we're using it from a care perspective and trying to make sure everybody understands kind of what needs to be done, but really taking it a step further and making sure that all managers are accountable for moving the organization forward. So thinking about optimizing uh, and, and looking at collaborating across teams and, and with others, what, what impact does this collaborative approach have in terms of, of leading to, to change that drives the mission? 
uh, I'll take that one first. You know, uh, OPM has several large program offices like any agency of our size. Because the CIO office has not always had this customer-centric approach, they've tended to develop IT roadmaps and plans on their own that aren't in alignment with where we're trying to go. Uh, and what, what these guys have done with me, which has been really great over the last year and a half, instead of those offices going off and developing these in a silo, uh, in fact, last Friday, all of us spent about four hours, uh, including me, and that uh, these guys know that I will be there the whole time to help show that I'm 100% behind this. And we like your roadmap, but we want to do it this way instead. We'll still get to the outcome. And I think a lot of them, you know, they see a demo of something and their roadmap becomes, I want product X. And what we have to do is change the conversation. You want the outcome of product X, but we already own a tool that will get you there. So um, it's an adjustment for them because I, I think sometimes they don't know what to do with us because we're saying, let's sit down and talk about your business problem. But well, I want to talk about my broken printer. Well, that's a different call. <laughs> let's talk about your business issue. I know you guys, you've had a lot of those conversations. Indeed, indeed. And, and, and you would understand that too, right? Uh, it, your customers, our customers, uh, have had a long time uh, in the fields doing their own, basically having to make, make their own way. Uh, because for whatever reason, uh, they were unable to execute their business outcomes using OCIO as a partner for whatever reasons. Um, so now we say, we're going to shift that dynamic. We're going to create an environment by which we want to talk to you about your business cases. We want to actually understand what metrics, what the key performance indicators are of your business. What do you care about, uh, Mr. or Ms. Program Manager? And they say, I, I, wh why are you talking to me about this? Right, is exactly what, what Guy said. I, why are you talking to me about this? Um, but there are also other customers, for instance, our, our, our friends on the data side, who, who have, have, have actually said, I've been waiting for this conversation for the last year and a half. Hot diggity, let's go, right? Um, there is a hunger out there because the world continues to evolve. And as we continue to say, how do we best optimize our services to our customers? It begins the conversation of, I can't do this without technology. Who owns technology? Well, in our organization, it's the OCIO. And we're here and we're engaging with you in that conversation. But it's not going to be this transactional, well, give me printer X or I need Haas server Y. It's going to be, let's talk about your requirements so I can satisfy those requirements. And I might be able to do so in a way that you weren't previously expecting. Uh, for instance, replacing replacing some rel rather proprietary hardware. Well, if I can if I can simply make a little tweak here within the pipeline, I can move that workload to the cloud and give you near infinite scalability, near infinite reliability on demand anytime. And you don't have to work all that procurement, all the procurement issues go away. And because they own that GSS, now your ATO is cut by 80%. And so all of the time invested in having to do all of these low value, high cost work, like, you know, how do I buy something? How do I maintain it? How do I do systems development lifecycle? How do I do COOP and DRP? All that stuff now goes away. It's now a transit and now it's, a, it's an SLA with a cloud service provider who has every interest in the world to deliver those best services. And it's so much easier. It's like, I can't believe we, I can't believe we waited so long. Absolutely. Al, anything to add? No, I think they nailed it. Thank you. Um, well, terrific. Well, so we're gonna, I'm going to ask a closed question, and then we're going to hear from our discussant, who I'll introduce momentarily. And then we're going to turn to you all, whether you're in the room or on the Zoom, to ask some questions uh, at the end. Um, so to close us out, there are agency representatives here, agencies sort of with us virtually, and those who will watch this later on and read the report. What advice would you give to your agency colleagues on sort of how to move forward based on your experience at OPM and also, Guy, at your other agencies? Uh, first thing is for all three agencies, I had zero dollars for a cloud budget when I moved to the cloud. So the first thing is get the desire and do it. You'll find a way to do it. What I did in all three agencies, is I negotiated with the CFO. If I'm able to turn something off under this fiscal year contract, can I keep that money and reinvest it in the cloud? And then I won't come to you and ask for cloud money. Guess what? All three CFOs said, yeah, I'll sign up for that. You're not going to ask me for any money. So do not wait for the two-year budget cycle to say, I can't go to the cloud yet because I don't have any money. 
you don't start off with a million dollar cloud. You start off with a small instance and you go from that. So that's my advice on the front end. You can self-fund this. Now we're at the point where, because our systems are large, we're looking at putting in additional money, but to build the foundation and, and my, my two leads here have been a big help in getting our, our cloud established. Now we have a place where we're not asking a customer to pay for that foundation of the house. We've already got the foundation and security in place. Now we can talk to them about migration. My other advice to everybody is there's two things that are gonna slow you down on this. And I've seen it at all three agencies and I've tried to fix it all three agencies and I've not succeeded. The first one is on day one, start working with your telecom provider to build the right size cloud pipe because so far in three agencies, it's taken me anywhere from six months to a year and I'm still counting. So I find a lot of people wait to do that at the end. If you spend six, nine months getting your cloud ready, you're gonna go another year before you're gonna have a big enough pipe to use it. So start on day one. The second thing, and uh, I'm a political scientist by nature and I've enjoyed watching all three teams do this. On day one, I tell them, I want you to blow up all of our change management practices. They will not work with the cloud. You can't meet once a week to decide if we're gonna add another server to an environment like you do now, and then have six months before it even gets added. Blow it up, go copy from any other agency that's ahead of us, go borrow. Um, in all three cases, I failed on that. My teams, I think they nodded their head and said, okay, guy, we understand but we're at the point now where we still haven't fixed our change management practice to stay at cloud speed. So the bottom line on that, the technology of building the cloud, that's the easy stuff. Getting a big enough pipe that you can actually use your cloud and then changing how you manage change at cloud speed are things you need to start on day one. Really important thoughts, thanks Guy. Dan? Uh, okay, I'll, I'll try to make this quick. Um, there's never going to be enough time. There's never going to be enough money. There just won't. So what do you do? Patent principle. A good plan violently executed today is better than a perfect plan executed next week because there's always going to be next week. Next week is just this revolving thing that it's just the <laughs> carrot that you can't, can't grasp. Two, uh, don't confuse efforts with results, right? There's a lot of folks who are going to work awful hard. Hours, papers, presentations doesn't actually shift a workload. Don't confuse effort with results. Always keep your eye on the prize and say, okay, does this activity, whatever that activity is, does it directly impact my ability to move those workloads in order to align with strategic mission vision, get my, get my customers better service? If your activities don't have a direct line to that bottom line, just don't do them. They're obviously not that valuable. And if someone comes back to you afterwards, I would happily stand up and say, look, I have five or six things that I can do today. I trace three of them directly to the, the business outcomes. I chase those three. Sorry. Who's going who's gonna to bother you, right? Keep your eye on the prize. Um, and if there's, if there's anyone left, I would say this is a little bit eccentric, but take time to use your test environments model your applications and your workloads with real data to ensure your customers that it's not just some miracle that it happens to work in the cloud, that you can actually show your on-prem workload, you give it certain amount of data, you get certain amount of outcome. You can mirror the exact same thing in, in your test environment and show them there's no difference between these workloads, except one's a lot faster. <laughs> One comes with a lot better security. The other comes with a lot better model your data, prove to your customers that this is the right thing. You can show them a GAO report that says I've saved $30 billion in moving workloads. It doesn't matter to them because they know that they'll be the person who's called to the hill if something breaks. So model it for them. It's not gonna cost you that much more money, but it will get you awful, awful great gains going forward because you can show that those workloads actually work and then everyone's behind you and you don't have to worry about the the fear and certainty and doubt those boat anchors that keep you back great insights thanks dan al yeah i think the only thing i would add on to that is um uh, get some quick easy low-hanging fruit as successes under your belt uh, we had some early migrations that we did 
the successful uh, migrations then sort of ended up having customers in our agencies that now are our proponents. They see that they've got uh, a, a IT team that has the intelligence, the understanding of what it means to move into the cloud, as well as a respect for their business to balance how quickly we can move into the cloud, which doesn't drag them down for some particular reason. And so having those early successes, building on those successes has been really critical for us to get the confidence of our business owners so that we can move forward. Thanks, Al. Well, when I think back to my time on President Obama's transition team, and we we're having early conversations about cloud first, and I see where Dave and Guy and the team have led the government and the stories in the report, it's just remarkable, sort of the progress that's been made. And so please join me in thanking the panel for this. So we're all gonna stay here, Dave's still here as well. Um, and I'd like to introduce, uh, to kind of summarize, give some additional insight, the leader for IBM Consulting's hybrid cloud transformation practice, who was a key member of the core team for the study, Rashida Rose Ashyampan. Rashida. Dan. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Rashida Osea Champong. Uh, that was a great discussion. Uh, the, our two Dans and, and Guy, thank you, Al. Uh, thank you, Dave. This has been a, it's been a, it's been a great journey. And what I will say that we've experienced over the course of this is we've heard about the human element of this. We've heard about at the end of the day, this is about increasing and improving the citizen experience, the employee experience. Um, and in, in so doing, you guys said it often, you mentioned it multiple times, it's about how we work together and how we collaborate. Um, one, one key takeaway that we've heard from OPM, we heard it from FEMA, from NOAA, from VA, is that we're, we're looking at transforming how operations work and with levering, leveraging hybrid ecosystems that just consider the, the human experience first, right? And so, so I, I, think, I think the discussion that you all just had really synthesized that and brought that to, to light. Um, we're talking about accelerating innovation and discovery. You know, at, the, at NIH, and you'll read this in the brief at NIH, the conversation was around how they're leveraging cloud to improve the pace of scientific discovery, improve the pace of medical uh, advancements and getting that out to, to our citizens. So, so when you talk about cloud, right? It can feel very technical and you can talk about all of the different technical steps, but I think we all agree that it's about the human element, it's about the experience. Um, so what I wanted to just close with with some just critical success factors that I think have been synthesized over the course of our experience here, and it's the fact that, that IT is very deeply aligned with business, right? You're talking about deeply aligning your IT and your business strategy so that you can best leverage the best practices of cloud. We're talking about um, um, an operating model that enables new ways of working and revise metrics that drive collaboration behaviors and that focus on shared outcomes. Uh, I think at the end of the day, that's that's if you took nothing else away from our discussion today, you know, take away the fact that it's all about the human experience and how do you get back to the human experience when you're talking about cloud adoption, and then it's about it's about focusing on. Uh, Dave, I think you said it best, what really matters, right? Measuring what matters and that's the outcomes, right? Um, so I, I appreciate everybody's uh, uh, time today. I think we're gonna kick it over and start taking some questions. Mark has uh, the microphone and I think you're, you're, we'll just walk around and get some questions. Yeah. We'll, we'll share one. Good morning, thanks for being here. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that I think our government and GSN and OPM are very lucky to have these four exceptional leaders. And I, and I mean that, it, it gives us great confidence in government. If you don't mind me talking back to the DCBC days, DC data centers before cloud, there was discussions between GSA and DOD to build out five mega data centers across, spread across the electrical grid for survivability. And Guy, you mentioned the constraint of the telecom pipe and Dan, you mentioned uh, disaster recovery. Is there anybody, and you two are central agencies, looking across government to say, if we're, if we're gonna survive cloud or EMP or something, that's looking at the, the total 
critical infrastructure of cloud and telecom? And, and you know, could we look at cloud as something like the, we looked at uh, the data centers as a shared service, not about efficiency, but about survivability? Thanks, Jim. Um, so I'm gonna let a GSA secret out of the bag here. Uh, we have not done a um, coop on the tech side, a coop disaster recovery exercise in four years. And it's because one, we live a coop environment every single day of our lives. Two, our technology is so distributed across vendors, across technology platforms, that we're able to demonstrate on a daily basis operability across this diverse technology platform every single day. NRIG actually says that's good. Uh, who, so we, the cloud has enabled us to operationalize that vision that was considered a number of years ago about diversity across multiple grids, technology grids, electrical grids, operational grids, geographic grids, um, has allowed us to operationalize all of that without that being the primary reason why we did it. It's a secondary positive outcome to that. Yeah, and I'll just add on our side again, like Dave said, the, the cloud uh, offers so much more than a physical data center. Just when we store something in the cloud, it's automatically stored in two different locations in that one data center. And then we also have another data center that it's automatically stored in across the country. So like Dave said, we're, we're not doing DR tests like the old way because those three copies are stored every second, every time we do something. And um, you know, I've also, I think GSA has done this too. I've moved more to a remote workforce. So if something happens in Washington, DC, I don't have 100% of my workforce here. We're scattered across the country and hopefully some of them will survive and be able to continue and connect to the cloud from where they are. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll, I would note that Margie Graves and I are part of a group of former CIOs that are working with Guy and some other CIOs to think, how do you think about IT modernization holistically across the enterprise? And there'll be more to come on that uh, in the coming months. So stay tuned. Other questions? One in the back. And if you could just identify yourself, that'd be great. Good morning. My name is Murthy. Uh, being an IBMer, uh, having had the great opportunity and privilege to work with most of our federal agencies here, uh, especially helping uh, GSA transition into the cloud uh, migrations, I just uh, want to raise a quick um, my personal uh, curiosity or a question for a OPM. Pardon me for taking back to the old days, like a reference for Y2K scenario, the urgency, right? And now fast forward with the recent presidential directive about uh, quantum safe cryptography. I just would like to see how OPM sees the urgency for cloud transformation, knowing that starting from the procurement planning and migrations that we work with all the other agencies taking longer than what everyone anticipates. So do you see a similar urgency for cloud transformation as well? Yeah, I'll speak first and then hopefully my, my partners here will join me. Uh, October 1st, I announced to the CIO team, we're gonna do a two year sprint to the cloud. Uh, and I was able to watch some of the faces, jaws hit the floor, uh, people falling over. Um, and because these two gentlemen had built that, again, the foundation of our house, our cloud was ready, our security was ready, at least one of the big pipes was ready. I'm still waiting on that second one, but one's good enough. Um, and I could tell they didn't think I was serious. And now, especially with the help of these two gentlemen, they're seeing that, in fact, every month when I do my monthly all hands, I have an hourglass and I'm showing them, okay, we're already this far into the two years. We put 28 things in the cloud, Great, we got a thousand to go. So. <laughs> right. Um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm full of useless quotes, but I, I can't help myself. I, I have to say it. Um, I think it was Abraham Lincoln that was uh, credited with saying, if I had six hours to cut down a tree, I would spend the first four sharpening the axe. So what OPM has done 
has invested an enormous amount of effort and work creating a, a world-class GSS. And uh, with the use of the Cloud Center of Excellence, uh, we have dedicated staff who are working to provide those fundamental underpinnings. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of workloads migrated. And frankly, there hasn't been a whole lot of pressure until absolutely recently uh, to do that. The pressure has been ensure that we can move a workload from a data center to a cloud, uh, to, to a cloud service provider with the maximum amount of efficiency, with the least amount of pain, that includes on the security side, how do we do an ATO? Because we know these workloads are gonna require ATOs. All of these considerations, uh, Al can talk at length about, about uh, the financial operations on the back end. How do we ensure that our customers know how much their workloads are costing? Do we get, how do we get that to them? Is it going to be an email report or is it gonna be a dashboard? Hey, Azure Migrate gives us the, uh, or Azure uh, Portal gives us the ability to see these things. So we've been spending the, that four hours sharpening that ax. And uh, I think that velocity is a fantastic metric. I'm not really interested in velocity. I'm interested in trajectory. Uh, I want to see the increase of those workloads over time continue to climb because we're gonna get better and better. And we're gonna test out all those fundamentals that we built. And if it's something is broken, we can iterate on that. But the fact is it's already there. We're not having to create that whole cloth. And so I'm, I'm very excited to see where we're going with that. And I'd really like to hear what Al has to say because he's got some really good ideas in this space. Well, I, I, I love how the, this question started out from Modi because it started out by, you know, if we think back to Y2K and for those of us that were around during Y2K, we had a lot of the same conversations we're having right now. It hasn't really changed. I mean, a lot of it is the focus on how quickly can we get these technologies over the finish line so that we can begin operating as a cloud-based uh, as a cloud-based organization. I think one of the challenges that we're going to be faced, and we were faced with it back then too, is that the customer organizations, they have their own business challenges they're faced with also. They're building new features. They're trying to build new capabilities for their customers in turn. And so it's trying to have a respectful balance between letting them do their business and manage their business at the same time that we're moving into the cloud. All of those are the same, are the kinds of complexities that we're working through right now. It's such an important role that OPM plays, providing every federal employee an experience so that they can do their job more effectively. Other questions? Is there anything online? There, there's, okay, great. <laughs> Debbie Granberry, IBM. Um, so Guy and um, Dan and Al, you talk about the thousand applications and systems you have yet to go. And uh, we talked a little bit about planning. Can you talk to us about how you're looking at the different workloads, how you're rationalizing, you know, how you making the decisions, which ones go, when, and what they need? I mean, that's a very hard question. Thank you very much. No problem. Uh, one thing that, that I got to thank Dave and the CIO council doing before is there is a CIO application rationalization playbook strategy. It's a great document as far as explaining to your customers that your application that's used by three people and would be really expensive for us to rewrite for the cloud, can we turn it off? Uh, so I really love that. I've had my team go through and they added one little twist to this that wasn't in their app rationalization playbook. We, for each application, we made a heat map of how hard it would be to move the application. So now we have the things that cost us the most money that are easy to move to the cloud are the biggest circles. And believe me, when I sit down with the senior leadership, it's very easy to show them that grid. And here's why we wanna move this application first and why we wanna move this last application last. Uh, so we did that work over the last year. Now Dan's been doing a lot of work and I'll turn it over to him on how we're actually measuring the outcome of those systems today. So we know what we have. Right, so we just recently rolled out a rolled out a dashboard that allows our customers to see in real time. Uh, and and I wanted I, I wanted I built it so that I don't have to recreate that work. Uh, it allows not only our customers but our senior management to look at workloads on a on a per workload basis and say where are we um, along the line of cloud adoption? 
One of the things uh, I've, I've said it a million times, uh, I think Al will, uh, um, Al, thank you very much for being remote today because he would backhand me if, 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 <laughs> uh, if I were here. I'd say, I want, I want a Domino's pizza tracker. And, and I want all of our customers to see that pizza tracker from, okay, we now have a workload. It's, a, it's in a data center, it's on order, it's ready to go. It's been rationalized, it's ready to go. Now, what's the next step and how do we get it to fully operational, validated, where the customer is saying, yeah, I, that, that was kind of painless. I did, I, thanks. That I didn't even notice there was a difference. Um, so the metrics involved with that, I, I don't want to get too far into it because it's a big, long, heavy conversation, but the metrics involved with that are really looking at the data that we have right now, looking at our workloads and examining the aspects of them. Say, for instance, um, FEHB, you have an open season. During that open season, it's a madhouse. There are millions of hits every single hour where people are just trying to get access to it to see what's going on. And we encourage everyone to at least look at it. Even if there's no change in your lifestyle, please go take a look at it. Uh, but from an architecture perspective, the week prior to open season, it's crickets. The week after open season, crickets. Okay, that tells me there's cloud business value there. And can I get those metrics in front of the customer to help them understand from like a, a per CPU basis, here's what it looks like before, here's what it looks like after. And they say to themselves, okay, no problem, but what if we take on more? And what if we do more and, and the federal government's going to grow or whatever? It's like, I'm not worried about that because we have scalability built in. We can continuously increase the workload on these applications so that your, your open season, we're no longer having to buy um, X amount of hardware plus 20% and do it for coop and ensure that there is a, there's a connection between the two. All of that is now reduced to an SLA with our cloud service provider. So these are the types of things that we have to talk about with our customers because they have a mission and that mission is not to understand IT. That mission is to leverage IT to their maximum effect. And so we, as the translators have to be able to show them how much life, uh, how much better life can be uh, when we when we say, okay, maybe we don't need to control that so much. Maybe we can offload, much like Dave said, we haven't done a disaster uh, recovery or a coup exercise in four years. I don't have to, I got an SLA. I got an SLA with Google, I got an SLA with Amazon, I got an SLA, and you just keep on going on. Every single one of these folks are guaranteeing me 99.99 or better service level uptime. My disaster recovery now is just a checkbox. Al? I think the only thing I would add is the ironic portion of, of all of this is that for uh, the application rationalization process we've gone through, it's all been cloud-based. Whenever we went ahead and got data from our customers to try to rationalize what we were going to do, whenever we provide analytics around that data, all of it's in the cloud. So not only can we turn around and say, yeah, we're going to move you to the cloud, but all the analysis we've done, all the information we're sharing with you, it's already in the cloud. So follow us along. Great. Any questions from the Zoom? We're all set. Well, thank you. Thank you again for the insights from our panel, from Dave. Thanks to Susan for the introduction. Thanks to Emma for the great summary. Thanks to Rashida for your great insights in terms of uh, following the panel. And thanks to all of you for joining us today for this discussion, both here and, and across the country. So Emma, uh, thank you especially for your leadership as the PM on this project. <laughs> For those who um, have already borne with us a few minutes past our programming, I will just say whether it's in your training filled TGI Friday or the revolving door of next week or the week after that, I encourage reading and sharing uh, mobilizing cloud computing for public service. If you want to drop off now before final acknowledgements, you are free and welcome to do so. Um, but to those in room and on Zoom today and throughout our webinar series, thank you for providing the inquiry interest and impetus for the partnership in the IBM Center to explore this topic. Um, to our partners in thought and action in discussion and as discussants, uh, thank you to IBM Consulting and the IBM Center. Um, to the partnership team, particularly the tech and innovation team, thank you for all the work that you've done. And uh, Dan, for someone who doesn't claim to have many quotes, you said, do customers have the faith, trust, and confidence to give the public the services they need and treat their data respectfully? Um, and we say to those experts highlighted across our events and in our brief, particularly with a special nod to David, Guy, Dan, and Al who joined us today, and the many colleagues, champions, and collaborators behind them and beside them, um, it's not some miracle. So thank you for building that faith, that trust, and that confidence. Um, I invite all who are in person to join us for a post-program reception. Thank you.